to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. What have they seen in your house? 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 15. Welcome to our study of Old Testament lessons. These living lessons often give us insight to the practical nature of the Old Testament and help us to see great living truths that apply to Christianity as well today. In the society in which we live, there is a great importance and relevance to the home. Think of these ideas. Broken homes, latchkey kids, single parent families. They all suggest that our society is in desperate need of God's guidance in the home. Marriages are ending quicker than you can imagine. Kids are being destroyed in the home because of the problems that arise. And yet the question Isaiah asked Hezekiah is still a powerful question for us. What have they seen in our homes? Do they see godly homes? Do they see godly parents? Or do they see things in the home that ought not to be there? Oh, how we need to be reminded of the words of Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The home is God's divine institution. He created it. It's older than the covenants. It's older than the church itself. And yet it is codependent upon those and it works together so well with them. Since God formed the first family, we need to go back to how God wants the home to go. Someone has rightly said, as the home goes, so goes the nation. How true it is as well, as the home goes, sometimes so goes the church. Is our home really a place where we can develop spiritually, where we can glorify God, and where all who are in it are encouraged to go to heaven? Let's first think about the background of 2 Kings chapter 20. In verses 1 through 11, we're told of Hezekiah's miraculous recovery by God. God helps him to recover, gives him more life. And then in verses 12 through 19, we're told about how, how foolish he acted in diplomacy, diplomacy with the Babylonians. He showed the Babylonians exactly what was in God's house. He brought them in, let them see the articles of gold and silver, let them see all the things that they had, their riches, and it is out of this that Isaiah rebukes him. The question the question of Isaiah is a question for the ages. What have they seen in your house? The real question is not what have others seen in our house, but what has God seen in our homes? It's God who matters. Hebrews 4 verse 13, He's the one who sees all things. He's the one who knows what's within man, John 2 verse 25, and he's the one whom we'll ultimately have to give an answer to in the last day. And so to help us determine if we have godly homes, we're going to ask and answer three basic questions from the Scripture. And the way in which we answer each of these questions will tell us if we really have a godly home that brings God the honor and glory. Number one, have they seen a godly home? What is a home? What's a godly home? Home is a place where all live and, and love each other and where all live and love God. It's a place where love ought to foster every decision, love for others and love for God. And it is ultimately a place where we can grow spiritually and help one another get to heaven. I believe Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 15 gives us the most detailed analysis of what a godly home really is. From this context, you learn four distinct characteristics of a godly home. First of all, a godly home is one that hears the Lord constantly. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. The scripture says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
What do we need for the home today? We need father and mother. We need children. We need grandparents. We need people in the home who will say, we're going to seek God's advice and we're going to listen to Him as it relates to matters of the home. We can't underestimate the importance of hearing God's Word. Jesus said in Mark 4, 24, Take heed how you hear. Luke 8, 18, Take heed what you hear. To the seven churches, Jesus makes this refrain, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. How we need to listen carefully. We don't need to be like those people in Acts chapter 7 who plugged up their ears and wouldn't listen to Stephen. We need the will and the desire to say, as Samuel said, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. How do we hear the word of the Lord? Well, we hear it by reading His Word. What we need in the home today to hear God's Word is a, a home and a family that will listen to God's Word by reading it. Is the Bible read in your home? Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading and how we need to read the Word of God today. We need to study the Word of God in our home. 2 Timothy 2.15, do we have devotional time for study? Do we teach our children the Bible? Do we study it ourselves? to make sure we're doing right. And then we hear the word of the Lord by practicing what we hear. A home without the Bible is a horrible home to be in. No one would want to live in a shack like that. Friend, don't you want to live in a home where we practice what we hear, where we put to use the teaching of God from His word? What else makes a godly home? One that loves the Lord fervently is a godly home. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. The second characteristic is, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We need homes that love the Lord fervently. You know, Jesus said this as well. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12 verse 30 following. What does it mean to have a home that loves the Lord fervently? It means that in our home, we're going to seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, All decisions in the home are going to be answered by a thus saith the Lord. The actions we take, the programs we watch on TV, the music we let come into our ears, what comes on the internet, God and the Bible and our decisions based on that, that's a home that fervently loves the Lord. Then a third characteristic found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is that a godly home is one where children are taught faithfully the Word of God. Notice Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 7. The Scripture says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them dil diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. What do we walk away with from Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 7? Every opportunity available, everyone that avails itself, we need to be teaching our children the Word of God. Socrates once made a good statement. He said, could I climb to the highest place in Athens? I would my life and voice proclaim. Fellow citizens, why do you turn and scrape every stone to gather wealth and take so little care of your children to whom you must one day relinquish it all? The people in the time of Athens weren't putting their children first. They were putting their jobs. They were putting their wealth. They were putting their own desires first. And he ultimately said, you're going to give it to them anyway. Why aren't you taking care of them? We need children today who are taught the Word of God. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 tells us, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. While we have opportunity, let's teach our children. You know, behind every godly person is usually a godly parent. What made Samuel such a great man of God? He had a mother named Hannah who gave him first to the Lord. What made John the Immerser such a great paver of the way for Jesus? He had godly parents named Zacharias and Elizabeth who taught him and showed him the way of righteousness. What made Timothy such a great gospel preacher? Well, let's look and see. 2 Timothy 3 verses 14 and 15 tells us, But you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, 
knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, taught him from childhood the ways of God. A godly home is also one that obeys the Lord fully. Deuteronomy 6 verse 8 also emphasizes that not only should children hear and those in the home hear, they must obey God. You'll do more harm to your children to take them to worship, to act like you're in submission to the will of God, and then live your life in defiance to it. If you really want a godly home, don't just talk the talk. You need to walk the walk. You need to make sure that you're living by the teaching of Christ. Paul said, I, I buffet my body daily and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. We need to be faithful unto death. Revelation 2, verse 10. We need to work diligently to make sure and go the extra mile so that our children see the word of God being obeyed in our life in each and every way. And so the first question, have they seen a godly home? Secondly, have they seen biblical role models in the home? For the home to be godly, it must have godly members. Uh, we've got to realize that if we're going to have godly children, we've got to make sure that we're the kind of parents we ought to be. Ungodly parents don't raise godly children. It just doesn't happen that way. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, we are given a picture of the role model, the picture of father and mother and children in the home. What is that picture? Notice the words of Colossians 3, verse 18 through 20. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. What is the role of each person in the home? Wives are to submit to their husbands. The idea of submission is not meaning they're inferior. In fact, we can't underestimate the value of a godly wife. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. 1 Peter 3, verses 7 through 9, she's from the Lord. She is the crown and the joy of her husband. Proverbs 12, verse 4, Proverbs 31, verse 10. And she is the one who is the queen of the home. Titus chapter 2 teaches her value in the home. And again, let's understand, submission is not inferiority. Just because you submit doesn't mean you're that person's slave, that whatever they say you have to do. That's not what we're talking about. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 6, Jesus put himself in submission, humbled himself, and became as a man, and even died on the cross. Submission doesn't mean you're under a rule, a tyrannic rule. We are under Christ's rule, but he doesn't force us or make us. The, Christ is, the church is in submission to God, and yet we still have free will to choose to do what's right. Submission means that we lovingly, and willfully, wives lovingly and willfully allow the husband to lead the home because of the respect he's earned. Because that husband is placed by God as the head of the home because he is putting everybody else's interest above himself and ultimately because he's trying to help people get to heaven. Shakespeare said it this way concerning submission. He said, if two people ride on one horse, they both can't sit in the front. Somebody has to take the reins. Somebody has to be in the lead, and God chose the husband to do that. How we need to realize that today husbands are the head of the home, and they are to love their wives. Colossians 3.19 says their responsibility is to love their wife, to love their children. They are not the reincarnation of Adolf Hitler, and they do not have a dictatorship and a tyrannic rule where they can say whatever it wants, and it has to be done. Did you know Ephesians 5 also says husbands and wives are to submit to one another? They need to be committed. Husbands need to be committed to loving their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. They need to have that sacrificial love that they'll put the wife and the family before self. 
that everlasting love that God has in Jeremiah 31 verse 13 or verse 3 and their love needs to be active. They need to show their love by making sure everyone is provided for, that the family is safe and protected, and that everybody is on the road to heaven. And then children also have a role. Children are to obey. Now let's realize first that children are a gift from God. Notice what the scripture says in Psalm 127 verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage or a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. How should we view children? Children are not something bad or evil as sometimes society makes them. Children are not lesser. They are a gift from God but they also have a specific role and duty. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, children are to obey their parents in the Lord. As long as father and mother are teaching and living by the word of God, parents are to obey that. Now, if father and mother said, we want you to do something that's against the will of God, we'd have to put God on the pedestal and do what he says, as we always do but how we need children who will respect and who will submit to parents so that the home can truly be a godly home. And then let's ask a third question to determine if one home, one's home is truly the right kind of home. Is it a godly home? Do common sins reside in your home? Are there sins of the husband and wife that reside in the home? Is there a, a lack of closeness in the marriage relationship? Is your home nothing more than a glorified holiday inn where people just kind of come and sleep and go to work and that's it? Or is it as 1 Peter 3, 7 says, husbands are understanding with their wives. They realize the important, uh, importance of marriage that God has joined it together and we should not let anything get in the way. Is there a lack of commitment between husband and wife? Do you really see your marriage as for life? Friend, there are so many today who view marriage in such a fickle and shallow way that you can just take off and put on the wedding vows as often as you like. God says marriage is for life. Look at Romans chapter 7 beginning in verse 2. The Bible says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, to the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to Jesus, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now, the application, the illustration is that of marriage, but he says truly, if one dies, then he's free from that law of marriage. We need to realize marriage is a commitment for life. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The one and only reason for divorce is fornication, and then and only then. Can the innocent party remarry? Is there a lack of consideration between husband and wives? Are we selfish or do we put others first in the home? Do we consider how our decisions will affect our wives? Do we consider how our decisions will affect our children? Is there a lack of communication? Uh, you know, the Bible says a family that prays together, or the scriptures teaches that prayer is an important part in our communication with God and in the family. Jesus taught us that we ought to pray. We see from his example that in Mark 1.35, the scripture says that we ought to pray without ceasing. How we need communication in the family with God and communication between one another. And then, are there sins of the children in the home that need to be corrected? Are children really obedient? Do children obey their parents? Exodus chapter 20 verse 12, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1, Deuteronomy 27 verse 16, are they really submitting to and obeying the parents? Do children disrespect their parents? You know, there's less respect for parents seems today than there's ever been. Do we still give them the honor that they deserve, father and mother? Do we still say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am? Do we submit to the parent? 
how we need children who will respect the home and see the home as a, a unit that God has put together to help one another get to heaven. In fact, isn't that the original design of the home? Genesis chapter 2, when God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, he made him a helper comparable to him. A helper to do what? Cook, clean, wash, uh, wash the children? No, that's not what God made Adam a helper for. He made him a helper to help him get to heaven. Are we truly doing what we can to help one another get to heaven? Or is our home sometimes a pitiful shack where nothing good dwells? They asked Isaiah. Isaiah asked Hezekiah, what have they seen in your home? And we need to consider today, is our home really what God needs it to be? You know, maybe your home is not what it needs to be because you're not a child of God. You can't have a home where people can grow and flourish without God. Is God really in your home? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a child of God? You may say to yourself, well, I want my home to be a godly home. I, I want my children to go to heaven. I believe in the importance of the home. If you do, then to get your home on the right path, You've got to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've got to realize that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Peter later said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You see, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. In fact, the Hebrews writer said, He tasted death for every man. If a person is going to be saved, it'll only be through Jesus Christ, and it'll be motivated by God's love. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. He wants that so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might be saved. John chapter 3 and verse 16. And as I think about what Jesus did, as I think about all that he suffered for me and for you, how could I not want to be a child of God? I want that hope. I want that joy that they had in the first century. Well, to do that, You've got to obey the gospel. Now, here's what the Bible says a person must do to be saved. To be saved, you first must hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, why do we need faith? How do we know hearing is essential to salvation? Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to to please God. And so if I can't please God without faith, then whatever way I get faith has to be essential. Remember again Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so you must hear the Word of God. You must recognize that this book is the only voice on salvation. It doesn't matter what someone writes, some human. It doesn't matter what someone else's opinion is. What does God say? That's all that matters. And then you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus put it this way in John 8, 24. Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. A person can't be saved outside of believing and trusting Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world, believing that God sent His Son from heaven that he came to this earth, that he lived a perfect life, and that he died a cruel death on Calvary for me, and that he is reigning at the right hand of God, serving as sacrifice and mediator for all who will submit to God's will. But then you also must be willing to repent of those things in your life that you know are not right. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus says in verse 3 and in verse 5, Unless you repent, you'll all 
likewise perish. Now, repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way in one's life. Once I hear what God's will is, I've got to repent and turn from sin. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. But just turning from sin isn't enough. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 through 10 says, They turn from idols to God to serve the true and living God. They stopped doing what was wrong and they turned in the direction of God to submit to His will. And then we must bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Luke chapter 3 and verse 6. I've got to show by my life I have repented. Then I must make the good confession. Romans chapter 10 verse 10, the apostle Paul said, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've got to do as the Ethiopian eunuch did. When asked, here is water, what doth hinder me? The response was, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And then a fifth step in God's plan of salvation is that you must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Baptism is essential to salvation. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 verse 21, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if the Bible says baptism saves, how can we differ with that? Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't be a part of God's kingdom unless you're born again by water. How do we do that? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And Jesus made it so clear. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And so have you obeyed the gospel to get your home on the right road? You've got to become a Christian. But maybe you are a Christian and your home is still not what it needs to be. Maybe there are things in your life that need to be changed. We beg you today to make that right for the sake of your home, for the sake of the souls that are in it, and ultimately for the sake of your own soul. Make your home a godly home. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.